expectations fluttering through the mind and the system all day long, taking up energy, occupying space, going nowhere, doing nothing for you, and there they are. All your expectations of wanting something to be better, and it doesn't get better, does it? You look for affection or love and you get strife. All these desires and wishes and daydreams which are not you at all, but you have been taken over by daydreams, expectations. You see we're talking about the same thing when I use all these different words. All these take over your day so that you never know that you crossed your house from one room to the back room. You didn't know where you were because you were off somewhere else. All these expectations that you have, daydreams, that's a better phrase maybe, they don't go on without your constant cooperation, wish, encouragement, and psychic sleep. They go on because, you know what the word permission means? Well, let's change it. You know what unconscious permission means? It means you are giving permission to these wild thoughts and desires, whatever they might be, and there's a thousand varieties. You let them go on without knowing what they're doing to you and what they're doing against you. But they seem, you'll agree with this, they seem so satisfying. And I, and I mentioned earlier, they seem so satisfying because they take up space. And now, having taken up space, the emptiness doesn't have to be faced. It's going on, and somehow you can sort of play the very familiar roles, stage performances that you play, that surely it's going to be better and you never understand, you never connect that phrase of things getting better with the fact that you are you. There are no, listen to me, there is no such thing as you and circumstances. It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is you hyphen circumstances. Can you, can you grasp that a little bit? What are you unhappy about? What is nagging you? What irritates you? Somebody says something. You get irritated right here in this class. You get irritated. What is the circumstance you're in? You and you alone, I am telling you, you are the only circumstance you have ever experienced in your life and the only one you ever will. Ah. But you don't want to... You don't want to face that. You want, you want to blame someone outside or you want to be in hope in your expectations for the future. You see, see, here's what you say, don't you? You say, something will be different when, when I get more money, when I lose weight, when I gain weight. When someone leaves me, when someone comes to me, there's always the when in there, and the when pushes everything away that you really need. You don't know what it means to simply be with yourself long enough so that you can be startled at this very intimate relationship with yourself so that you see absolutely no question about it, no doubt about it, that you and your conditions are exactly the same thing. Uh, now you see the trap. You want conditions to change while you remain the same. How can that be? It can't be. For conditions to be different, you have to be different because you are your conditions. Now we've grown into the block again. You don't want to see this. This, is, this challenge that I have just given you so far has become the threat. 
You're, you're not, you are not sure whether truth is telling you the truth or not, whether it's even accurate or not. And that's, and that's your excuse for not testing it to see whether it is or not. Your expectations, your wish for things to be different, I'll pr put it in a little different way this time, are constantly being watered by you. Just like plants have to be watered, you're watering those. What do you suppose you're watering them with? Would you like to think a little bit? How about uh, watering your faults, your traitorous, that's a better phrase, watering your traitorous expectations with um, self-deceit, with um, heavy thoughts even, with gloom. Yes, you can water them with that because so you remain in the center of the picture of the things. What do you suppose would happen to any false wish that carries you away from knowing that you're walking across the room? What do you suppose would happen to it if you didn't water it? You know what would happen, but you won't dare you won't dare make the experiment. You, you have to, you better go out of here tonight. You'd better go out of here tonight and understand why you won't go through the process of conscious loss. Conscious loss can only begin when you're in a certain situation and you're staying as awake as you can and you determine right then that you're not going to water your old psychic system with its usual reaction to it. Instead, you're going to experiment, as again, as best you can, by seeing what it means to be new every moment. So that, listen, so you don't expect the black knight, the evil black knight, to come rushing along with his horse and his lance to fill in with your usual kind of destructive reaction, including guilt, in including shame over the fact that you are not behaving properly. Ah, I am not behaving rightly. I get angry, I get irritable. Who are you talking about? See, see how you lie and recreate your false existence? Expecting, expecting the black knight to be good. Try to see how confused you are in your mind and that you expect your wrong reactions, your wrong thoughts, your wrong feelings to expect or to reward you with a right feeling, with a, with a right outcome. You be very noticeable, very watchful now to see how you have certain desires. What do you want? Come on. What do you want? There are right wants, of course there are, but we're not talking about them for now. Natural wants, right wants. You want to grow, that can never be wrong. See what you want, and then see what you get. I defined it a little earlier. You want things to get better, according to your definition of what is better, which is all wrong anyway. But you want things to get better, and instead of that, oh, the boredom of the sameness! Doesn't it drive you crazy? Of course it does! The boredom of living with you! The boredom of repetitious thoughts and the same evasions you have to take all day long like a football player dodging the tacklers. Always dodging something, aren't you? And always hoping that even in that brief, even in that brief four-minute conversation with someone here in this room, oh, how you, you have an expectation and a hope and a prayer that you'll come out okay in it. That you won't say something stupid or they won't think badly of you. Or better yet, you expect that you might make the remark that gets a laugh, that in some way 
brings credit to you. Sometime during conversation, in fact, try to do it as immediately as you can. Sometime in a conversation with other people during the break, for example, and everywhere for the rest of your life, have a conversation in which you never make one aggressive mood in any way or word in any way, and that requires a little bit of explanation. Nervousness, tension, expectation always acts. It always acts outward from itself, partly to get something, partly to ward off what it calls danger, a threat. It is always in movement of some kind. Can you stop watering that particular type of expectation of coming off right in a little conversation by sitting there and being silent? And not, you talk with the other person, of course. You talk when it's good to talk to, to them, when it's necessary, when it's the right thing to, get, I'm, to do, and I'm talking about an ordinary business conversation. Can you begin to see when you, can you see the difference between you, your essence talking, and your nervousness talking? Can you do that? Detecting the difference in an ordinary conversation, if you're with a, someone of the opposite sex, maybe, maybe you're a little bit attracted to him or her, can you begin to see the split moment when you become unnatural? And you make that unnatural remark, or whatever it is, I'm telling you that you are, you are watering all your wrong expectations, including the expectation that you'll simply come out of that four-minute conversation okay. i tell you, look, I know and you know how deep the wounds are, don't you? You know that. I know that you know that, how bad they are. And so we've built up to an incredible extent, to an extent that we don't see a, a, a closed eyes defense mechanism habit. So that no matter what situation we're in, we have the expectation that we'll come out okay in one way or another and water it with all the wrong things. Imagine a scientist he has a big greenhouse, and he has uh, hundreds of plants imported from foreign countries. He's a, a botanist. He has this enormous greenhouse, plants of all sizes and shapes and colors. And his motive, his aim, is to take all these plants and test them, see which ones would be perhaps uh, produce superior apples. Another one would be valuable because it's beautiful, beautiful flowers, blossoms on it. Another one would be uh, valuable because it could grow in cold country. They need trees in some cold country. Some. So he goes around experimenting with all these trees and watering them, of course. But he very personally notices one day that he feels ill. So he forgets it, as most people do when there's a slight illness, thinking that it'll go away. But it didn't go away. It just persisted. And he didn't know where it was coming from, and he knew it was, wasn't something that he had to go to a doctor for. It wasn't that severe. But being a scientist, he investigated his own illness, and his first discovery was that it happened only when he was in the greenhouse. Never when he was home or out shopping somewhere, but only was inside the greenhouse. Did he feel ill? So he looked all around the plants, tried to understand the connection between his illness and these foreign exotic plants. And he narrowed it down to five or six of them. Something was happening, and he began to suspect and listen and see if, if you can parallel this in the spiritual life. He began to suspect that these, one of these plants was giving off poisonous fumes. Plants can be poisonous, you know. So one was given off a very, some plant from some far off country that no one knew, no one knew anything about was given off poisonous fumes and he was breathing it in and that 
confined atmosphere and it was making him ill. So he wisely thought of one way to find out which one it was. Each day, one day, he would cease to water one plant for a couple days, another plant for the next day, and the next plant. And he noticed one plant in particular, when he stopped watering it, it ceased to give off the poisonous fumes. Now he knew he had the, the villainous plant. And, by the way, it was one of the most beautiful plants in the whole greenhouse. Beautiful blossoms, colorful blossoms. That's the way it is, isn't it? The pretty exterior. What are you going to stop watering in order to notice that you get just a little bit healthier inside when you don't water? See, but you have expectations from all these plants, and you can't separate the good expectations from the bad ones. And you're afraid, you're afraid to stop watering them with your egotism. Take, take one, one idea alone. Suppression. Do you know that you're watering it and it's giving off poisonous fumes all day long? How many of you are suppressed? You can all raise your hand. You know what suppression means, don't you? Suppression or repression both mean about the same thing. That means this. That means huddled up inside yourself with your eyes closed and, and dreaming your way through circumstances, outer circumstances and inner ones. So here we have this suppression. And you do, do you know what your present reward of it is? It's giving you a sense of safety. Now look at that. Now look at it. Why would anyone suppress their feelings and suppress the natural powers of self-expression that they have? You've seen it in yourself, and you've seen it in other people. Why do they suppress what is natural inside of them? They do it because they feel safe that way. They say, I am safe by suppressing, not speaking up, not saying anything, kind of hiding out, kind of whispering through life. I feel, I feel that that will make me safe, but they don't see that they're not safe. The seeing of contradictions is one of the single most important tasks you have as a spiritual student who wants to wake up. Now, we're, t we're all talking about all this is good news because it's factual. But, but think of the phrase, spiritual living space. I asked one of the men the other day, and you heard me, if he was looking at another member of the group at one time during our banquet and seeing the physical freedom of the member of the group going around, enjoying himself. And this person I asked said, yes, he did feel envious of him because he couldn't do that himself. He was suppressed. He didn't dare. You see, you don't dare because you want to keep your image, which is the same thing as wanting to keep your pain. Spiritual living space. You can, you, you can have spiritual living space around you of five feet or of five million miles, which do you want? If a bunch of settlers come from the east and settle in the pioneer days in a large forest, one of them builds his little cabin. He builds his cabin, and then he clears the bushes and the rocks for just five yards around his cabin. He hasn't got very far to go, does he? He's not very safe, is he? He, he looks out, and he five, just a short distance away, all those animals are looking at him from the bushes out there. He can't take a walk in his own yard. He can't be free. He has to stay inside. Another one, maybe a little wiser, would build, clear the grounds, the rocks and bushes for 20 yards all around, put a fence around the edge. Now he can walk a little further, can't he? He can sit out in the sun if he wants. He can take a walk around his place. He can plant a vegetable garden. He's got much more. He's got much more living space. You can be a lot wiser than that, because there's a third pioneer who, could, who can put a lot of work in it and clear the ground for 100 yards, 200 rounds, all, all around. Look what he's got. Look at all the clear space he's got. 
But this takes inner labor in the spiritual world to get spirit clearing space, cleared space. You have to work hard. Now, as I talk, you think of how you can ever motivate yourself to work hard. It isn't easy, is it? You don't quite know what to think. But I'll tell you what it is, and I'll tell you in one word, and again, after hearing this, you have no excuse for not, for not getting the arousal to want to get out there with your pick and your axe and clear all the land around so that you're no longer suppressed and sit in the back row. But you can go anywhere because you've cleared the space for it. One thing, and I, I'm telling you now, only one thing, but how beautiful, one thing will motivate you to give you the energy to go out and work and give you the kind of a life you want to have. And it is called submission. You want your way, then you have about two yards outside of your life, outside of your cabin, to walk around. No wonder you're cramped and crabby. No wonder. You, you may look out the window of your cabin and see someone else 200 yards away and he, he has a big yard. Why do you suppose he had it? Now, those men we mentioned, those pioneers, they submitted to natural laws, didn't they? Isn't there a natural law that says if you want clear ground, you have to get up with the, out with the pick and axe and you have to get the horses onto the rock and clear the rock and the logs out of the way. You have to do some work. Submission to truth, submission to spiritual power, I am telling you, it, 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 submission is the only thing that will give you the vigor to go out and work, to, to break outside of yourself, outside your little cabin. You, you, walk, you walk around it all day long, don't you? You dread it because it's a very small place, just two or three rooms maybe. And you're so bored, you don't know. Aren't you bored? You're all bored. I know you are. You, no wonder you are living in there for all these years, nothing new, nothing fresh, all because you're so lazy. Now you understand that there is a natural urge inside of you that if you submit to truth instead of to your own lies, you submit to that. As frightening as it is, as scary as it is, you submit to the spiritual laws inside of you, you will begin to feel yourself wanting to get up out of that chair in the house and get outside and start to work and clear it. It'll be a very real ex experience to you. And you know people, you may live with people, and, and just now you are one of the people who wants to sit in the chair and just complain at how restricted your life is, how suppressed it is, and how you have to protect yourself from all those scary eyes of the wolves out there in the bushes staring in at you. Don't, look, don't let the word work scare you. It often does, doesn't it? You don't want to do this or that. There's, a, there's an entirely different meaning to spiritual work. And that work, that work re returns <coughs> an entirely different reward that you've had up until now. You love your present reward of darkness in your closed eyes, fearing that you're going to get fired for heaven's sake, fearing you're going to lose someone, fearing you're not going to lose someone. Right? See, you're not going to get away with just one half of the opposite. Well, if you uh, admit you're sick and you phone the doctor, you'd better be home when he calls. What about that? A man phones the doctor and says, I'm ill, come on over. This doctor makes house call. The cosmic doctor makes endless house calls, very patient with you. But anyway, a real doctor who isn't quite so patient, you call him and when he gets there, you're not home. You call him the next day and say, I'm sick, come on over. He comes over the second day, you're not home. 
We got at the ball game several times. Shall I tell you what the problem is? This patient and you, you forgot that you were sick. You're, sit you're sitting at home in agony. And the telephone rings and they invite you to a party. All of a sudden you're not sick anymore, huh? You had better remember how sick you are. Internally, you know very well. You, you know very well. Now look, you are supposed to be able to take more than the world out there. You are supposed to be able to take more of the truth. So let's see if you can. All of you here in this room are far worse off than you know. If you think you're 10% all bad off, you're a hundred percent badly off. You're, you're racing thoughts and, and your desires for certain things that you can't have. Look, look at how, look at how you are permitting yourself to be driven crazy daily. Of all the words, many, many words, strong words, explanatory words that you've heard tonight, do please take away the one word, submission. Think about it, connect it with what we've talked about tonight. And know that you can begin to submit to something else, something other than what you have submitted to up to now. You have submitted to your neurosis, to your fears, to your suppressions, because this, I tell you, this is all you know. I can understand why you do it. I'm asking you to understand, as a beginning, that you can submit to something else, and if you'd cease to water the old neurosis, you'd begin to see what it is. You have to start making little, tiny, small victories that will lead to the next one and the next one. And every time you make a new victory, I absolutely guarantee you it will be a larger one than the one before. And, and the light will dawn in your mind one day. Where, see, you have doubts now. I know you do. That there would be no question at all, but that you are doing the right thing at last for yourself. <coughs> it starts with submission. Even if you're afraid, submit to God. Can you imagine that? Afraid to submit to truth that wants to save us, submit. How many of you have a spark of intelligence? <laughs> How many of you think you have more than a spark of intelligence? How many of you evidence it in public contact? Well, let's try again. How many of you are unhappy? How many of you want to be happy? Now, you all just deceived yourself. All you do is go around kidding yourself about what you want. Do you know what you want? You want an alternating throb of petty little pleasure and agonizing pain. That's what you want. How many of you have been coming here for at least a year? Let's see your hand. At least a year. Two years. Three, four, five. Let's see the five and six years people here. Four. <laughs> now, you, Alicia, how many years? Six. Six years. I graduated yesterday. <laughs> I look at you having come here all these years and I talk with you and I see your minds operating and I say now there's a perfect example of a human being who says one thing and does another now I ask you if you wanted to be happy and you raised your hand in the first place, how do you know what happiness is that you want it? You say you want happiness, which assumes that you know it 
when you see it. You don't know it when you see it. So on that one count alone, you're deceiving yourself, but it's far deeper than that. Now I'll tell you why you're unhappy. It's terrible. You're unhappy because, because all you ever see is yourself. You look out into the world and you see what? You see the car, you see the woman, you see the position that you want. And without knowing what you're doing, because you haven't explored inwardly, you connect everything with what you see. You connect it with yourself. Now, now follow this. There is a seer, right? Someone who sees something. There's the object of the seer's action, which is the scene. There is what is called you seeing something in the outer world. But what you see out in the outer world is also you. It is impossible, absolutely 100% impossible for you to ever see anything but yourself. You are glued to what you see. It is you. Because when you see that car or see that circumstance, you go into either what you call a pleasurable or a painful reaction, and both reactions, painful and pleasurable, are you. You wouldn't dare to gamble, would you, to look out and see that condition, see the circumstance. You wouldn't dare to see it without you being there. Because if you did that, you'd be happy. Can you see the difference between seeing something and knowing something? And I'll have to answer the question for you. No, you can't see the difference. Seeing something means that there is an observer there. And the er observer sees something and then reacts to it according to the observer itself. To the seer itself. So that your ego, your self-centeredness, always wins. It always succeeds in getting a reaction of some kind, which is what you want. The painful one or the pleasurable one. Now, see if you can remember what I just said and take a long leap to this. Wholeness, mental health, spiritual health, true spirituality never sees anything. There is no seer there at all. The seer is the distorter according to what it sees and then divides either into yes or no, negative or so-called positive. Truth has no need to observe, has no need to look at something and say, what can I get out of that? What, can I get a favorable thrill, thrill or an unfavorable thrill, a pain, for example? Reality truth never looks out and does that because it has no need for anything. Would you not say that God is complete? Reality is whole. It has everything. All right, now, if you're not happy, if you're not happy because you're not in this state of wholeness, the reason you're not happy is because you're trying to be. The reason you're not content is because you think that the self you now live from must go out and obtain something in order to be content. And what you think you have to obtain can be a series of sticks of dynamite that are very dangerous to your daily life. Complaining 
all day long. Looking around and enjoying your dark state. I know when I look at you and see you in a gloomy state, see you moody, see you sitting right in this room and just sort of staring dully forward. I know where you are. You are in your preferred world. Well, you prefer just to stay there. And then, then you can be there and say, ah, I may be unhappy today, I may be dreary, and I may be unfulfilled, but tomorrow is going to change. Something is going to happen in that outer world that is going to automatically make everything better. And so that hope becomes your answer. Now let me ask you, you have to answer this to yourself, did you follow the point that where there is someone seeing something, there has to be an object of what it sees. Therefore, you are split. Therefore, you are not content because you're looking at something in order to be content. Attacking another human being or attacking a political system, attacking anything at all, can be a marvelous form of self deception in which you say, if only they were like me, all would be well. Well, as a matter of fact, they are like you. You know the whole world is just like you, and you are just like the whole world? What makes you think that just because you come to this class that you're putting health out into the world, or that you're contributing something to it? The contribution of spiritual health is a very, very subtle and quiet thing. It is so quiet that the world never hears it, never sees it. And wholesomeness knows that. What's the opposite of the quietness of, of mental health? what you were doing, the way you were living. Your life is nothing but a racket. And everyone you meet hears that racket. They see you. Let me tell you how immoral you are. You're immoral by being you. You know nothing, you know nothing of the spiritual world at all. I know that. And you suspect it. See, you, you students of the higher path still go around asking what's the answer. And I'm going to tell you something that you don't want to hear. When you ask, what's the answer, who is asking the question? Desperation? So you were desperation asking, what's the answer? I want the answer. As if desperation wants the answer, solutions. What you want is not answers, not solutions, not health, but vibrations. And by deceiving yourself, and by saying, using the question, what is the solution to my problem, whatever it might be, by saying, what is the solution to my problem, your answer is in the very asking of the question. Because when you say, what's the answer, you vibrate. And every time you vibrate, for the period of the intense period of the vibration, for a few seconds or for a few minutes, you feel all right because you have just given yourself a drug. It's 
so that you don't have to see anything. It closes your eyes. And then, and then when your inner system begins to suspect that the self-administered verbal and emotional drug is wearing off, when your system begins to suspect it, it cries out to you, go to it again. And then if you can't find anything to crab about, to hit, you don't see anyone close enough to hit, your imagination does it, and it works just perfectly. You can go into your imagination and assault the whole world and get a vibration out of that. You had better listen to what I'm going to tell you next. You are, you are vibrating yourself into a lifeless existence. That's all you are, is a series of what you call pleasant and what you call unpleasant vibrations. Listen to me, you are nothing at all but that. You have no life, you have no cheerfulness, you have no light. You're pathetic people. And you can be very grateful for something. You can be very grateful that I don't fall for your act. Neither you ladies or you men. See, you don't really come out and say, I'm going to fool that person. You don't have to say it anymore. It's so deeply ingrained in you that you just fall into it automatically. And so when you ask questions, what's the solution? How can I get over being attacked by my gossipy neighbors? How can I get over my financial problems? I hear you saying these things, and by looking at you, I know that you don't want an answer. What's the point of giving you one? You don't want it. What you want to do is talk on and on and on, and you don't even hear the answers. Having said that, I'll tell you what the answer is. Instead of, instead of asking, what should I do about this or that? Try sometime changing it to, who can I change? Can't you see that's a different approach? See, when you ask, what can I do, that's like a bat flying out of the cave and asking, how can I be different from a, being a bat? A bat is a bat. A bat asks, how can I look like a butterfly? How can I act like a butterfly? It's a wrong question. Because, because a bat can only be what his own nature is. So you're kidding yourself when you say, how can I be different? I want to be better. I want to be nicer. I don't want to yell at my wife as much anymore. I don't want to be as cruel anymore. Putting yourself and your deception is very satisfactory to you. Because now you don't have to do anything. You don't have to face the truth. You can be as, as vicious as you want. You can hide out as much as you want. Live in daydreams as much as you want. And of course, you'll remain a bat. Bat being a creature who lives in the dark. Flies around the dark doing evil things, right? You're making a great mistake in relying on words. Talking to yourself and telling yourself about change. Words aren't going to change you at all. Quotations aren't. Reading words in a religious book aren't. I'll tell you what will. And for this whole weekend, it would be an excellent idea for you to just remember this one word I'm going to give you next. The word I'm going to give you is the key to everything different. It'll give you a happiness of a sort that you don't know exists. See, you don't know what it is, happiness is. 
Do you, do you, happiness is getting more money down at the office? Happiness is having your candidate win the election? Getting a smile from someone that you want to approve of you? That's what your idea of contentment is. That's your idea of contentment and you have never reached it. Not one of you in this room. And you're not going to reach it unless you do something drastically different. The word I'm going to give you will give you a clue in that direction. Write it down, please, or remember it at least. Think of the word replacement. Replacement means to change something utterly. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean to uh, take a study course so that your old nature speaks better English. It doesn't mean to run religious phrases through your mind so that you can convince yourself that you're therefore religious in your nature. Your mind is chattering, but it doesn't go any further than that. The word replacement is the very heart the very key of all the true religious teachings that say in one way or another that for you to inherit something better, higher, longer than this life, you must replace what you are now with something else. Not a modification of your nature, not adding church going to it, not adding anything to it. If you add, if you add a pretty rose to the back of a bat, then that is a bat with a pretty rose on its back. So it's not the addition of anything to your old nature and not going into imagination that the old nature is different simply because it has the rose on its back. The world is bitten and infected and poisoned by billions of human bats with roses on their back, which other people look at and say, he must be different, he must be all right. Look, he has this rose there. And once you get bitten, it's too late. You've been infected. Here's a chair. Say the chair is rickety, falling apart. Now I can either paint it, make it look good on the outside, then if someone comes and sits in it, they're going to collapse and hurt themselves on the floor, fall on the floor and hurt themselves. That's wicked. Oh, that's wicked. Do you know what wickedness is? you know what evil is? To paint the rickety chair and invite people to sit in it. And what do you, what do you, what do you care whether they fall down and hurt themselves or not? You got paid. Maybe you rented the chair out for 10 cents an hour. What do you care? You got your 10 cents. People have no, no conscience at all. You don't know that. You, it's too much for you. I could go further, but you wouldn't get it. You'd think it was fancy. People have no conscience at all. As long as they don't get caught, anything goes. As long as they don't get caught, anything goes. Now, if you were a truly decent person, or beginning to be decent, you would look at that unpainted chair, you would see that it's broken. You would see that it's dangerous. And one word would come to your mind, wouldn't it? Replacement. Take that chair and toss it out in the trash. It belongs in the trash and so does your present self. You're nothing, you're nothing but trash. You're, all of you see, you're nothing but trash. Except in a little bit of light. That's the beginning. You can't ask now what the replacement is like. You don't know what it's like any more than you know what happiness is like. What you can do, what you can do is be willing 
be willing to sacrifice all your uncertainties. Let's try that one again. What you can do in order to begin to let reality replace your nature is to begin to give up your doubts. You are your doubts, therefore you refuse to give them up. Your, your, your doubts, and your uncertainties, and your tremblings are you, and they give you something to do. And you know the rule. A human being who doesn't know the right thing to do will always do the wrong thing. And since you don't know the right thing to do about anything at all, you always do the wrong thing. You can't even make the simplest decision for yourself. Because you don't know the difference between right and wrong. You do know the difference between what you want and what you don't want. And that is what you call the difference between right and wrong. How infantile. It's the old story in the law courts, isn't it? A man goes to law and sues somebody. If he wins, justice has been done. If he loses, it's a cruel, vicious, unjust world. That's his idea of what is right and wrong. Is that yours? By the way, who are you blaming? You've got a lot of problems, haven't you? A lot of pressures, a lot of uncertainties, and a lot of envies. Who are you blaming for it? Go, oh, come on. Right now, as you're seated there, and I'm asking you the question, can you find out who you're blaming for your heavy spirit, for being trapped in life? Who are you blaming? It gets a little muddy, doesn't it? You go from one person to another, circumstances. Or you might be tricky enough to say, I blame my own stupidity. And you just did it again. You just deceived yourself again. You get a little pleasure in calling yourself stupid. You get a certain, a certain sense of security, of a certain sense of I-ness. The letter I mean I. A certain sense of solidity by saying, I am stupid. There's your vibration again, which you won't give up. To give up the vibrations means gradually and gradually, as you understand that the only thing that makes sense in life is to give up ideas about yourself, gradually the vibrations get less and less and less and you begin to look out, begin to see in the right way of seeing. You begin to see a world that you have never seen before. I, I will tell you, you will begin to see by being it, not just viewing it. Religious hypocrites view the world. You as a person who is truly spiritual, you are the world. There's no division between you and what you see. You are what you see. They're not divided at all. Which means a change, a fundamental change of nature just as real, a thousand times more real than replacing the rickety chair with a brand new solid serviceable one. Now, now look and see where you are. You're now right in the exact same social world and physical world. And you have exactly the same circumstances, but they are no longer the same circumstances for you. They're the same ones for that person you work with down at that office or wherever, or at the home. But they're different from you because you're a different kind of a person. You have to understand you and whatever world you experience are the very same thing. And I illustrated that one, one time to you, and I'll do it again. <clears throat> An angel can go right into the depths of burning hell and not be burned. 
He, an angel can walk all around for years down the bottom of hell and not be touched by it, not feel the heat. And you can see all, thousands of devils down there. And they can be shaking their pitchforks at him, threatening him and screaming at him. Now why? Why can you, at this, likewise, be in this world and not be of it? Because the angel takes his angelic nature and wherever it goes, heaven goes with it. See, you move right down, the angel moves right along the path, right in the middle of hell there. How can it touch him? He has his heaven with him. He carries it with him. Now you can be in this hellish world, this very evil, sick world. And if you don't think the world is sick, then you're sick and covering it up. You can be right in, in, in this sick world and be untouched by it. You, you're not touched by it because you are not touched by it. This new nature can't be touched by it because it's in a new nature. Story illustration of that. If you're up on a mountain and you look down at two armies battling down there, slaughtering each other, how can it touch you? You're not on that level anymore. Let me repeat a little point and then we'll have a break. If you still think in any degree at all, that this is a decent world, you are indecent. If you think that, you know, people are trying to be good, don't be critical of people, they're doing the best they can, they are not. They are not doing the best they can. When you're doing the best you can, you begin to change. Now what you're really doing is not defending the world out there, but your own sickness. You don't care two cents for anyone else in the world. You don't, you don't. When you say, well, it's a good world. I, people have their faults, but fundamentally, people are good. You're just saying that about yourself, and you're trying to con yourself and other people into believing you're a lie. And that's why you stay sick. And that's why you are indecent. And that's why you put your poison out into the world. And if you don't like what I'm saying, that proves it. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the facts. And if you get angry at the facts, you yourself have proved within yourself at this very minute that I have told you the truth. Now, what are you going to do being trapped like that? If you have an ounce of sense at all, what you will do is permit yourself to be trapped altogether and not try to escape it so that you start to shake and tremble and wonder, wonder what on earth is going on inside you. This is a new experience then you ought to be very grateful that you get trapped in this room. Every place else you go in this world, no one's going to trap you because they want your money. They want your sex. They want your what? You name it. Truth is a double-edged sword. Fierce, fierce and compassionate. And you see that. And oh, you'll want to be so fierce toward your own self-deception. You'll cry out, how could I have ever lived this way? And then you understand why. Because up to this point, you have refused to face yourself as you really are. And as long as you continue that way, you will slide downhill and be more wretched on Wednesday than you were on Tuesday. You think of the term replacement and put all the elements together of this talk. You'll turn yourself around so that on Friday you'll be much clearer than you were on Thursday and on and on and on. Very beautiful. Life is complex. It is staggering at times. And even at the times you don't feel staggered by it, you kind of sense that the next blow or the next discomfort or the next mystery is about to arrive. 
So really, in the human heart, there is no contentment, no control at all. There is simply sometimes an absence of an exterior or inner challenge. We can discover tonight how to change everything. And that change of your life, of your mind, of your spirit, starts with a very careful examination of your present ways, of the way your, way your mind functions, of how your feelings take you over. Have you ever watched a movie, perhaps on television or in a movie theater, and the sequence of actions went something like this? After the, all the credits, which go on for a long time, the first scene appears. And here's the scene of a man, let's say, walking along the seashore with a pair of binoculars. And he's walking along the sand, and every once in a while he picks the binoculars up, looks out to sea. Walks a little further along down the sand, picks them up again, looks out to sea. And you're always looking for something. But you don't see what it is. You don't understand what's going on, of course, because it's the opening shot of the movie. So you see that for a short time, and then abruptly the scene changes. And the next scene you see is of a man working out in his wheat fields, a farmer, let's say. And there he is working out there, and after a minute a car comes down the country road, a man gets out out of the car and puts a box on top of a fence post, leaves it there, drives away, and the farmer goes over and gets the box, opens it and looks inside of it. Change of scene again. Now you get two openings, right? Next scene shows a office building at night, and you see a little light up on the top floor of this big tall office building at midnight. And the camera takes you inside, and there three women working at night, and they seem to be doing something very important, very active. Telephone rings. One of the ladies answers it. Immediately she says something, puts the phone down. All three of the ladies get out of there. Chain of scene again. You're beginning to get a little worried now, aren't you? Is your memory going to be that good? Oh, but there's more to come. Next scene is a scientific laboratory, and there's a scientist in his white smock going over some notes. And in a few seconds, the lights suddenly go out, and you hear a scuffling in the dark, change of scene again. Have you ever noticed how, opening the, how confused the opening of movies are, and you begin to worry that you're not going to be able to put all those pieces together? Sometimes you're able to, and sometimes you're not. Very often, if the movie maker isn't, isn't aware of the viewer's minds, he'll leave all those pieces unraveled. And at the end, you say, it was a good movie, but what was it all about? Good life, but what is it all about? Hasn't that little illustration, doesn't it parallel the way your life goes? You've got all these little unconnected, disjointed scenes in which something seems to be happening that's important. And just about the time you think something is going to happen in your favor, change of scene, something entirely different, the marriage didn't work, or the business matter didn't work out as you wanted it to do. And so here we are, going through life, seeming to be the victim of these sudden changes in scenes, and none of them we can remember, and none of them we can put together as a whole. Now, very fortunately, we have a, a cosmic director in this life who can show you what all of these little short incidents are all about, why they happened in the first place, and put them together so that the end of the life movie, at the end of your enlightenment, which will go on for a long, long time, you'll understand why they happened as they did, and you'll understand why you were in them as you were. So that's the situation that life presents to us, wondering just 
how we got into a certain situation in the first place and how we're going to get out of it. So that brings us to just one, one thing left. Solutions, answers. How can I make my life so that, so that I am the director of it myself and not some foreign agent? not someone else who is setting the scenes in front of me. Why don't I direct my own life so that I know what's going on all the time? And you can. You really think, unfortunately, that you have to be the victim of the exterior director called general life, called other people, called circumstances. You believe in it. I know you do. And it's about time you stop. Now to the question again, how are you going to do it? If I tell you to turn toward a higher source in order to make the life movie scene a good one, an understandable one, if I tell you to look higher than yourself, you ask, but how do I do that? If I ask you to find help, something, strength, that is higher than your own mind and your own present level, you're going to say, but how is that accomplished? You always ask that, and, and when people ask that question on themselves, how am I going to straighten out my difficulties, they always refer back to the movie maker who created those wrong scenes, those choppy scenes in the first place. And so the chaos continues. Man's situation on earth would be hopeless except for one thing. And I want you to remember what you're going to hear next. I want you to remember it for the rest of your life. Man's situation would be hopeless except for one thing. You can have a yielding to your yearning. There it is. Do you know how important that is? I'm going to say it again. First of all, do you not have a yearning for something higher, something better, something freer, something more healthy, something less, less lacerating to your spirit, less pounding? That yearning for something different is in every human being. Everyone is discontent. Everyone wonders what it's all about and where they're going to find a little peace of mind or a little quietness or a little security. They have the yearning, and because they direct it in the wrong places, they wreck the world. They wreck the individual world, and that wrecked individual world, going mad, going crazy, wrecks the rest of it. And so we, and so we have four billion people on Earth racing around not knowing the answers, but assuming they can find them within their own mind, continuing the problem. So I said, if you yield to that feeling, yield to the feeling that something is wrong as it is, yield to that feeling so that you see you can't of your own self. Now this is spiritual. Nothing is more spiritual. So that you see that you can't of your own self change anything. If you have the, the wish, the desire, the yearning to change who you are, it can be done. But you have to have a pure yearn, yearning, which is this. You have to yearn for something different without knowing who is going to change you. Now, I'll tell you right now who and what's going to change you, and you can call it God if you want. You can call it something higher than yourself. You can call it spiritual ideas, spiritual principles. That is what you're going, that is what you're going to call on to change you, but you don't as yet know what they are. Therefore, you will make the mistake of calling on yourself instead of upon spiritual principles, and nothing will change. Now, here's the secret. If deep in your heart you yearn for the new, for the transformed, for the truly 
wholesome and healthy. If, if you will let the yearning be there without trying to direct it, the very yearning will then turn in the correct direction, which will be up there, something coming from up there, down to answer that yearning, and you will change. You know, an awful lot depends on what you are listening to while you're in this state of wondering about this choppy life of yours. And you'll find, if you look a little, little close, you'll find that you're listening to just one thing. It seems like a thousand things, but it's just one thing. You're listening to your past. You're listening to what other people have told you is right. You're listening to what this group or that organization told you is useful and necessary for you. You've listened to them, and yet nothing has changed. Here's a man who's hungry, and he's out in a big area somewhere. And being hungry, he looks around and he sees a, the woods out some distance away, very dark woods. But he can see from where he is that that's, uh, there's a lot of fruit trees in. There's apples and there's grapes and berries. He can see that there's fruit growing in the forest out there. He is hungry, and so he yearns for the food in the forest. So he says to himself, the sensible thing to do is to start walking to where the food is. And then he makes a terrible mistake. He asks himself, and he asks his friends, if it's all right to go, for heaven's sake, is it all right to go toward truth, toward reality? And all his friends, being what they are, they look over at the woods and they warn him against going there. They say, do you know that there's dark demons in there that'll attack you if you walk into there? That, that fruit is a trap to get you into, the, into there, and you will be, if you go in there, you will be unhappy. You'll, you'll be lost. Now comes the decision point, whether he's going to yield to the pure yearning of wanting his hunger satisfied, or whether he is going to listen to someone else, listen to other people who are deluded, who want to keep him where he is so that they can feel safe with his company, if you can imagine the madness of the whole situation. I'm talking about a spiritual journey to you. Are you hungry enough to forget everything in the past and forget, forget all for the sake of the, of the kingdom? If that man paid attention to one thing, one thing only, to that yearning and yielded to that instead of to whisperings and accusations and falsehoods, and ignorant people who claim they were intelligent, if he listened to his original yearning alone, that would start his footsteps walking toward the forest. And when he got there, he would find his hunger would be satisfied, and he would find out that there are no demons there at all. And he would know where the demons really were, and all those people who tried to keep him from making the journey. So there must be something in the way of us starting off for the forest where the spiritual food is ample. And I'll tell you what it is with a little illustration. There was a teacher who had only one answer to every problem that his students came to him about. They came to him with problems about family life and about sex and about finances, and about the future, and about their depression and their loneliness. Every day, dozens of people would come to him, and he always gave every single one of them the same answer. And here is the answer. And here is the answer to the world. Your only problem is that you refuse to see yourself as you actually are. Now, the next time you have a problem, why don't you try that, that superior solution for yourself? Instead of going off into 
all sorts of wrong excuses, explanations, and just say to yourself, the only problem I have is that I refuse to face myself as I actually am. And if you do that, you will see that you're confused, and then you will refuse to take an answer from that confusion. You will refuse to go and ask your friends whether you should go into that forest or not. You will let the yearning remain very, very pure. Oh, what people are missing. Oh, what men and women in this world are losing out because they don't understand what real beauty and happiness is, which very briefly for now is to walk away from our own deluded selves. How do you like living with yourself the way you are now? Now be real honest. How do you like going home with yourself, away from this meeting? How do you like, how do you like living with yourself 24 hours a day? See, that teacher was very wise, wasn't he? He wouldn't accommodate the listeners to answer the way they might have wanted an answer, but he was direct and firm and very, very compassionate and that he forced them to see that the only problem they had was the way their mind worked, which was wrong, the way their inner system worked, which was all delusion. Now, I want to tell you another story which will illustrate the human situation a little more broadly. You'll see yourself in this. I'm going to talk about a king, and every human being on earth is the king of this story. There was a king who lived in a castle. He was a young man, just recently become king. And being young, he didn't understand how to run things, the royal kingdom, just as young people and older people don't know how to run, run their own lives. So he asked advice of his counselors. And there's one counselor who was very aggressive in particular, a man who was very forceful in his manner and seemed to know what he was talking about. He was very decisive. So this counselor came to the king one day, shortly after the king had been enthroned, and he told the king in a very serious manner, as you know, your majesty, this is a very wicked world, and there are enemies surrounding us, There's enemies who would attack you if they could. So I want to rec highly recommend that you put yourself in my hands, at least for a while, to accept my recommendations on how to govern the kingdom. Because if you don't, then these wicked enemies, whom I know very well, will find ways to make your reign uncertain, to make you afraid, and to even maybe topple you off the throne. So I highly recommend, Your Majesty, that you put the running of the kingdom, more or less, in my hands, with you, of course, having the final say. So the young king, being troubled and uncertain, was glad. He was glad to turn the kingdom over to the counselor. Are you following? I'm sure you are. So the counselor began to give orders and to advise the king, which gradually grew more, more into orders than advices. But the king, sensing this, didn't know what to do about it. He was just a young man, and the other man was older and domineering. Besides that, something very strange happened over a period of months, and that it always happened at night. And what happened was that the king who slept in this royal bedroom with the door locked and a guard before the door. Every morning when the king got up from his bed, he was shocked and frightened at what he saw. Because what he saw every morning inside this locked room, that something was out of place that had been in its proper place when he'd gone to bed. For example, there was perhaps his, a coat that he'd laid over a chair carefully the night before, 
And when he got up in the morning, the coat was laying in the middle of the floor. Or when he got up, he had a few coins laying on, his, on a table. And when, he, when he went to bed, the coins were there. And when he got up, the coins were in a different place. And this is very frightening because some agency had taken those articles and misplaced them deliberately during the night, put them somewhere else, and he couldn't understand it. And then he remembered the warning that the counselor had given him about certain weird and mysterious happenings that went on that might go on during the night. And he remembered that the counselor had told him that and became even more frightened because the prophecy had come true. So this went on for a long time, and the king's terror grew, and his dependence on the counselor grew. Following still? Are you following it? Is this your life? You know it is. Who are you depending on? So this went on for many years, and the king matured a bit. He grew older, and his own mind began to function a little more properly, he began to think for himself and from himself a little more. And then he got tired, ladies and gentlemen. He got tired of being afraid of all these mysterious happenings. So he decided one night, instead of going to sleep, he was going to stay awake and think the problem over. Just see if he could think it out. And so he stayed awake, thinking the whole situation over from where it had started. He thought of the counselor, and he thought of the mysterious happenings at night. And he stayed awake, he stayed awake so long that something happened. And what happened was that he heard a little sound in the room that was quite different than he ever heard before at night. And he saw a movement on the far side of the room. And he immediately jumped up, turned on the lamp. When he turned on the lamp, the whole mystery was solved. Everything became clear. One of the soldiers had crept in through a secret panel into his room during the night, a panel he knew nothing about. And he, of course, had rearranged things to make it look as if some mysterious force was attacking the king, trying to make him nervous. The whole thing became clear because he stayed awake and turned on the light. And of course, his action following that was very easy. No problem what to do next. See, if you're awake, you will always know what to do next, no matter what the next was. And what he did was dismiss the very evil counselor and all his evil friends who had plotted together to keep the kingdom under their power. So staying awake is the whole, the whole secret, but if I ask you what it means to stay awake, will you know the answer to that? Do you know what it means to be awake? You don't even know what it means to be asleep. Let me tell you what it means to be asleep as a start for you. To be spiritually asleep, psychologically in slumber, means to be scared. It means to be angry. It means to strike out at the world, thinking that it owes you something. That is what it means to be asleep, and on and on and on. If you're lonely, you're asleep. Now look, you wouldn't consent to any other human being deceiving you if you knew about it, would you? Would you consent to anyone playing tricks on you? But you, if you didn't know it, then they would get away with it because you simply weren't aware of it. Why are you permitting dark forces in this world to keep you asleep and to deceive you, to so deceive you that you're scared, that you're nervous about life, that you're doubtful, that you change your mind constantly as to what's best for you? Now, I've asked you a question. Why do you permit yourself to be deceived by two things, which are one thing? First, the deception in your own mind based on wrong acquisitions, false ideas. And two, 
by people out in that world that you think can run your kingdom for you better than you can. I tell you, isn't, let me give you some good news. No one can run your kingdom, your life for you better than you. You are the perfect one to run it for yourself. So why don't you start?